So we're on week three already. It's going by pretty quick, isn't it? And this is the week that we've done some reviews. We did one Sunday. I did one yesterday. They're both posted. And then you have one coming this coming Sunday, which is the lead of the PN program. So I do highly suggest look at mine with your study guide. It follows it completely that I gave you out on week one or two. I gave it to you. So you've had it there. Um, look at it. Fill it in. It'll help you understand. If you're not understanding, go back to the uh, review that I gave you or go back to that week. Maybe something in that week can make you describe and understand things. Um, that study guide is a great outline for you. It has uh, most everything that you, you're going to see on the exam, okay? Professor, um, yes. it's Yvette. I'm, I'm not sure if you can see me on the screen. I don't even see myself. I see you. Okay. You're sort of looking upward at you with a blurred background, but you're there. Okay. Okay, not a problem. But thanks for checking. It's always good. So we did our quiz too, you know, all in all, they, they weren't bad. Um, I understand a lot of you, you want to get your nines and tens. I understand that, you know, I am a grade oriented person myself. Um, so uh, I will be checking that out for you. So thanks Roland for, you know, opening that can of worms and seeing what I can do to help there. Anything to help I'll do. Uh, 50 NCLEX questions are due. So make sure you do what the modules tell you. Don't just pick out what you want. It should be done um, on the, the areas in the modules that it tells you. And um, next week when you come to class, you're going to be coming to class on your mobile device or another device. I will be doing the 360 check. You need to have your ID with you. And um, I'll be checking whiteboards. Um, I take paper, but you really should have a whiteboard, okay? Um, they're in the dollar store, you know, little tiny ones. Or take a gallon Ziploc baggie and a marker, a dry erase. And if you put a piece of paper inside that baggie, you can see and write and then just wipe it off when you're done. It is a cheap way of, you know, having a whiteboard without just a regular paper, okay? So those are tricks I'm telling you. So I usually uh, come a little bit earlier on exam days. You will have class afterwards. Now, some of you uh, in the past might want to have taken your uh, exams on campus. If you do, I need to know by next Tuesday, Wednesday latest. And it's not you telling me, it's whoever is going to do the proctor on the campus needs to email me so that I can give her the access code for you next Friday so she has it for you, okay? And remember, even if you do that, you must be here for class. So our class starts at six o'clock Eastern time. You need to be here by 7.30 Eastern time on exam. That's an hour and a half with a little bit extra for setup, et cetera. And then we're gonna have about, uh, you know, a little bit over, um, almost an hour to get what I need in. Um, I usually uh, have condensed the information so that I can get all what you need for that week into the class, all right? So this week, what are we doing? We're doing chapter 20. Um, it has a lot to do about healthcare adaptations. I actually have two PowerPoints for you. One that um, mixes a little bit of everything. Um, but it's growth and development too. And I think it's a great thing to give you right before your exams because it's going to get you thinking a little bit more, okay? And then when I'm done with the PowerPoint, of course, we're going to do those two codes. So let's get started. So healthcare adaptations. Well, there are differences between your child and your adult and how we care for them. I mean, the simplest thing is they're smaller and they're bigger, but also um, has to do with their bodies. Their bodies are a little bit different than adults. And the way we do things is different. How we give an IM injection, right? On an infant versus an adult, all those things are things that we need to think about. Now, children are children and usually are there with mom and dad. 
And mom and dad usually sign the consent. At age 18, not parents does not sign that anymore. An alert oriented, cognitively aware child at 18 is now signing their own consents. And what does that mean for us? Remember also, we need to get permission from the child to speak to the parents now because they're a responsible adult, okay? That can lead into some issues some of the time, okay? So make sure that um, when we're doing things that we are uh, remembering that. One of the hardest things, I think, that you're going so busy and especially in the emergency room or urgent care and you're trying to get things done and like, oh, I should have talked to the child uh, first before the parent. So just remembering that. One of the things that we know that through the career of um, hospitals and patients and medication errors and accidents and whatnot, we have found the number one reason that there's errors is because a lack of a ID. Uh, JCH, JCAH, the Joint Commission, um, identified it and said, okay, yeah, all right, there's no IDs. What are you doing to promote and stopping and correcting that? Well, you see on units, there usually is one person assigned to once a week, once a month, twice a month, whatever it is, um, to go around to all the rooms and check to see if that child or the adult, their adult world, to make sure that they're wearing an ID and that the ID is correct. And it's important because it does eliminate a lot of errors, right? If you're trying to scan something, which today everything's scanned, you know, your medications, your little guns, you have to, you know, go to their little, you, your little codes and make sure you have the right patient. It really helps. It helps with wrong medicines. It helps with, you know, wrong um, patients, just that scanning stuff too. So safety is always a concern. One of the big things in children is that they do like to get up and move and move around and uh, fall and get into things. So one of the things that we know is cribs. We must keep the sides up if you're not in there. You know, today they've got even the cribs, the side rails up. And at the end, there's little doors you can go in, take care of the child and then close and latch the door when you're done. So it's not up and down the whole crib side. Very important. Also, if you see that crib up top, it's what we call a bubble top. Toddlers like to climb, right? So we need to make sure that they're confined into that crib because they'll just come out and fall on the floor. Um, they don't know better. They're just climbing. Looks like they can get out. They put their leg over and then they're on the floor. So those little bubble tops, as we call them, are really, really good. Another thing is don't push them to the head of the bed where the oxygen and suction and your code blue bell are because children will get into all of that. So make sure that it, you're pulled back that they can't reach it, okay? Toys in the bed, anything in the bed, make sure that it's safe, that it can't harm them, can't cut them, et cetera. Never leave medication sitting there, of course. I mean, even ointments, kids will get in it and eat it. Um, and some of them uh, can really cause them some harm. So, or at least make their gastric uh, be an upset, right? So make sure that's not in there. Another thing is in rooms, many times there are two beds in a room and one kid sees something, what's what the other kid has, there should be no sharing unless you're thoroughly cleaning it before you give it to the other child. Like what I tell you with toddlers in daycare, right? What do they do all day long with those toys? They swap spit, one toy to the next to the next, to the mouth to the mouth to the next mouth, right? In the hospital, they're already sick, right? They're there for a reason. So we don't want to increase those chances of infections. Oxygen is always, you have to be careful with. You know, adults, children, doesn't matter. You know, it, it does, um, helps with combustion. And so, of course, anything, you know, flammable, et cetera, shouldn't be uh, there um, just to be careful and safe with it. You know, if they're with one of those green tanks, making sure it's secured, uh, doesn't fall down, et cetera. Now, one of the things that children do um, is they like to get out of their rooms and walk around and, and they just, they're curious. 
And if they have the ability to be able to get up and walk around, we have to be careful. Um, usually there's like a little alcove that has wheelchairs or little wagons or stretchers and kids love to play with it. Again, they can pinch their fingers um, and do all sorts of things. So making sure that we don't let them be there alone playing with it. If we have a kid in a high chair or in one of those swings or something, never to leave them alone. Um, they can again try to get out and they can harm themselves. Little tiny little kids, kids, infants, um, they shouldn't be just laying in a bed alone. Um, they need to be in a crib, side rails up. Uh, at five months, these children are turning by, you know, the latest really is five months, turning from their abdomens to their backs so they're rolling. And then the back to their tummies, you know, so now they're rolling completely over by six months. So we never leave them unattended because they will fall out. One of the things they recommend against is propping food. You know, it's easy to sit there and just to prop it up on a blanket and let these children eat. But what if they start to gag and choke? Now they're gagging and choking and more because they've got that fluid in their mouth. I mean, they even tell you at home, uh, tell parents, don't let them prop. Taking kids from here to x-ray to here to procedure anywhere needs to be done in a proper fashion. You know, I love the red flyer wagons and kids, you know, being transported in them. And I think it's the cutest things. And little boys and little girls think it's the neatest thing that they're in a wagon. Now, in a hospital, we have little seats and little, you know, uh, straps to uh, buckle them up in. Um, but... Um, it is a way to get them there that they're secure and safe. We do transport in cribs, we transport in beds, we transport in stretchers, wheelchairs. Um, wheelchairs, it could be sitting in mommy's lap is actually the most safe of all ways. So we're pushing mommy and the child down the hall. All of those things are okay. But again, making sure that they're strapped in, they're safe. A parent should just not carry their child to whatever procedure. They could trip, they could fall, the child could be hurt. And then guess whose responsibility that is? Us. Because we didn't maintain the safety of that child, okay? Anytime a child leaves a room, make sure they have their ID bracelet on. I think the one thing that's the hardest, you're busy, you're on the unit, things are going crazy. They get your kid to transport you to bring him down to something. And that nurse says, uh, there's no ID bracelet on this child. I can't do anything until you get down here with an ID bracelet. And guess what? You have to stop everything, get the ID bracelet and go down there. Another thing. After you check that ID bracelet, check the order, make sure that's what you need to do, document. How did they get there? Who put them there? And in what type of transportation, okay? It covers you as a nurse. Now, assessment and children and adults. Well, we know children are completely different than an adult assessment. If you have a sleeping baby, I'm gonna be listening to heart sounds and breath sounds because that kid is quiet and you're gonna be able to really accurately hear those sounds better. And then sometimes you can't get to something. You've got to do the assessment slowly. You've got to do it um, talking to the child, especially, I mean, even a one-year-old, they really understand more than you really think. Explaining what you're doing in a fashion that you're non-threatening to them, okay? If you're taking any sort of specimen, blood, urine, uh, stool, um, saliva, Always make sure that um, we're explaining that to the child, what we're doing um, and documenting that we did it. And then if we're doing any treatments, uh, whether it's medications for pain or for fever, you gotta go back to see, did it work, right? Did the medicine work? Did it do what it's supposed to do? Or if there's no response, like an antibiotic, no allergic reaction seen, okay? So all these things, documenting is going to help the nurses and the physicians after you. So again, you know, the infant, I, it's the hardest and the easiest of all to really do an assessment on. Uh, but again, remember, the smaller infant can get cold really easy. 
the older infant, not as much, but you're not just going to take all off their clothes and just do an assessment. You know, you just lift it up as you need it and go underneath and maintaining that warmth, um, depending on those ages of those child. We know that kids need to first trust you, build up that some sort of rapport. I always, as I said, I'll never stand up and do anything for a kid. It's a great reason to pull up a chair next to their crib, next to their bed or the mother, sit down and then do something on a developmental level that makes that kid feel more comfortable with me. You know, sometimes I'll just say a peekaboo or maybe older kids. I had stickers of boys and girls for every ages in my pocket all the time, you know, or I would have a little stethoscope and I would put it on me and I put it on you, and put it on mommy. And now I'm making games of it, especially toddlers. They love that game. Right. And the older infants are the same way. You know, I, I think that sometimes um, just the way that you talk to them, the way that you make them comfortable, taking those couple minutes, and that just really takes a couple minutes, really calms a kid down. And we know by history that a pacifier in the mouth of an infant is a self-soother. They're stressed, right? You, somebody's there trying to touch them. They don't know you. Stranger dangers, right? That eight to 10 month old, especially. Stranger danger give them a pacifier, do that opening stuff, sitting below them, and you're going to get everything you need to get done easier because you took just a little bit of time. When I am doing anything to a child, infant, I am telling that infant, child, toddler, whatever, I'm explaining to them what I'm doing, but I'm not speaking really to the child um, completely. I am teaching the parent as I'm doing it. I am listening to the breath sounds. Ooh, I can hear all the air going in and out. Ooh, I see a little mucus in the nose. And yeah, so let's just, you know, clean that out. Or, oh, I hear the heart. Ooh, look how pink those fingers are. The capillary refills good. Tummy soft. I mean, I am describing all these things and it is a great, great teaching moment, okay? And then of course, after your assessment, you're gonna document what you've seen, whether it's normal or not normal. Now, looking at a kid, it's the saying, well appearing and sick appearing. And that is absolutely a child. When they're sick, they look sick. And when they aren't sick, they look good and they're up and around and moving and talking, et cetera, et cetera. So how does a kid look? That's number one, always visual first before you do any touching there, okay? When you're in a room with a kid, you're always looking what they're doing developmentally. Are, you know, a kid who's one year old, you walk in and they're trying to walk around the room or they're taking a block and they're building, you know, blocks. Um, they're grasping at, when they're younger with, you know, their voluntary grasp. I'm looking, are they developmentally where they need to be? You know, nurses catch this stuff before physicians do. We're in the room all the time. Physicians are 10 minutes and gone, right? So we are the eyes and ears for these children to tell the physician things that they do need. I'm also looking at the parents and the children and how they respond to each other. I'm also looking at that child when the parents aren't there. Um, are they where they need to be? Are they too quiet, withdrawn? Or is something happening? Because there are little clues that after a while in pediatrics, you'll be checking it out. I mean, pain is one thing we look for. And that could be, you know, that infant sort of hitting their head or touching their head. Or that toddler sticking the fingers down the throat, their throat hurts, right? They're giving you all of these clues. And I saw all this by looking at it and what they're doing. If you see a kid who's just there laying in the bed, afraid to move, we know something's happening. And then let's look at what's the diagnosis? What does that child have done? Why are they here? So if they're here with abdominal pain, they just had you know, maybe an appendix. Well, we know they're in pain. So um, you will see it like they're rigid and they don't even want to breathe. They're afraid to move because that's how much it hurts. 
So what do we need to do? Well, we need to get them something for pain or notify the physician about what's going on. Children, we always, always are careful looking at them because we are the child's advocate. There is abuse out there. I've seen quite a bit of abuse, more than I ever wanted to see in my lifetime. So always looking at the child, seeing you know if they have any extra marks or bruising, or if there's differences in stories, all of these things are little clues and you know maybe I need to get the social worker in there or maybe it's obvious now I need to get the charge nurse and you know um, DCF or whoever to make sure that that kid is in a safe household. I mean I've had three cases where um, we had to call the police and DCF out of the ER and all different reasons and um, those kids today are safe because I first caught it. You know, maybe another nurse might have not. I don't know. But um, again, your job is to keep the children safe. You know, they say even how clean is a child? Well, you can't always relate it there. Uh, you know, kids are out playing in the mud, the dirt. That's when they get hurt and go to the hospital, to the ER, right? So you, you can't say that. But are the clothes, do they fit properly? You know, um, like those sort of things. Or is you know, like the hair like too greasy? Um, or the teeth look like they're not been taken care of? These are little hints, you know, of uh, abuse in one way or another. Um, that picture of that girl up top, we need to understand that is medicinal. That is, you know, the Asian cures, the cupping to take the pain or whatever poison in the body out. So again, if I saw that, my first thing is, so what is that? You know, I'm going to ask number one, the parents, because it's just too, you know, the same thing everywhere. So it had to be something um, that they were doing. So not everything is abuse, but you have to really um, pay attention. So the history. The history is all about the kid and what has happened. You need to know uh, what's happening. Well, at birth, you just wanna know, was it a normal delivery, a C-section? How many days were in the hospital? If they were in the newborn ICU for six months, no, that's more significant. But usually I don't need a birth to eight years old where they are right now sort of information. I just need to know what is going on right now? Why are you here for this visit? I need to know what medications they've taken because I'm going to give medications. They might have a fever, but I also need to know any herbal alternative, any things. You know, cultures all have their own cure. You know, in Miami, it's chicken soup cures everything. My husband is Jamaican, it's ginger and garlic teas, but remember those G's, uh, which promote bleeding, okay, prolonged bleeding could be a problem and maybe a child going to the OR, right? So these are things we need to pay attention to. As we keep going and asking questions, how are they eating? How are they normally? Are they healthy? Do they sleep? Do, are they potty trained yet? You know, the younger kids, especially if they're going to be the histories for an admission to a hospital, we need to know that in case the parents to step out, right? Parents can't usually be there 24 hours a day. You know, they do have responsibilities. So knowing a kid's pattern of behaviors does really, really help. And these special words or gestures like, you know, this is more in my household. Um, it's something that my uh, daughter-in-law started. And today I was watching a video of my seven-year-old grandson and she's sitting there with a little licky pop. And then she said, do you want more? And you could see the kid all of a sudden put his hands together. Seven months old. He's telling his mother he wanted more and he was sitting there cooing, whatever. So how do you communicate? Really important. I wouldn't have known that if I didn't know her. Now the physical is all what you can see and hear and you can touch. We know that it's head to toe upon admission and once a shift. And then if there's any change in status, you're going to focus to, is it breathing? Is it fever? Is it GI? What's going on? And to, to assess it as best as you can. Vital signs are the TPR. Um, weight 
And Heights, always on admission. We always want to watch that. I mean, kids' weight, how much they weight is all about nutrition. So not gaining weight or gaining too much, both of them could be an issue. So we are looking at, even if it's non-related to the admission, are they hydrated? Um, you know, how do we check hydration in children? A uh, heart rate, now for me, is number one, you know, unless they have a fever and then it's, oh, can't be heart rate because heart rate's going to be up anyway and they're in pain too, heart rate's up. But are they urinating, capillary refill, their color? Their ears, believe it or not, tell a lot. You, their ears will go pale, you know, when you start getting more dehydrated. And infants, the fontanelle will sink in. I think infants are the easiest to evaluate. And can you imagine an infant crying with no tears? That is a severely dehydrated infant. Of course, heart sounds, lung sounds, bowel sounds, and then the overall condition of the skin. Now, pulse and respirations, and how do we do it uh, on children? You know, we will do an apical pulse on all children younger than five. It is the most accurate. Now we can do radial, but it is recommended that we do apical to age five. Also respirations, we need to know, children breathe irregularly. They breathe shallow, they'll deep, it's irregular, irregular. So counting again, that should be counted for a minute also. The, we know that the heart rate, like I just said, if you have a fever, heart rate's going to be elevated. If I see a heart rate up, you know, I'm immediately going to be checking a temperature. Um, I'm going to be asking about pain or I'm going to be looking for dehydration. That's a big, big clue there. And as I said, infants, they're going to get fussy quick. They have no um, time to just sit there and relax. They, you know, you don't have time get the heart rate, get those respirations first. And then you do all the pulses and looking at, you know, uh, fontanelles and et cetera. Blood pressure machines um, and blood pressure cuffs are all different sizes. Now, that one on the bottom can fit on your little pinky. And that's the one of your little uh, premature babies. And it works really well. I actually like doing blood pressure on children under the age of three or four on their lower leg because the upper arm tends to hurt them. And now if you do that before anything else, these children, they're not going to trust you because I don't like it done on my upper arm. It pinches. It hurts, right? So the lower leg, you can distract them with something else. Uh, I'm just saying it's a good thing to do. Blood pressure cuffs, blood pressures in children, we know start out at the neonate at 60 over 40. First 28 days, that is a real accurate blood pressure. Um, it's a good one. It's like a 120 over 80 for adults. So just remember the different categories, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate that they're different, you know, and I did send you that thing. Blood pressures, it's really difficult to take it when they are crying. So as I said, I usually hold the leg and maybe I'll be talking or even these little neonates, maybe I'll be rubbing a little lotion on them, you know, talking to them, keeping them calm. Um, it does make a difference. Now, fevers. Fevers, are really not dangerous. In fact, once you have a fever, you're actually safer. I have never seen a child with a fever, and I've seen up to 106 something, um, have a seizure. When it's the problem is that when they have no fever and 20 minutes later, they have a fever of 101, it's the rate of rise so quick. And that's what causes the febrile seizures. OK, so fevers are a response telling you something's going on. OK, and it is the body's protection mechanism basically is what you need to know. So, you know, the antipyretic 
basically stops prostaglandins. It's this hormone that creates fevers, okay? It stops it and then it brings it down. We know that children with fever won't eat, won't play, will sit in the corner and they'll look miserable. Give them something, a good dose, a proper dose of an antipyretic and a half an hour later, they're up and out and drinking and running around the room. And that's what children do. And that's why we bring the fevers down. How do you feel with a fever? Horrible, right? So do children. So once that fever is gone, they're going to be drinking and being more active, which is what you want to happen with a fever of anyone, especially children. Make sure to keep them drinking. So hyperthermia is an elevated temperature, right? And it can happen um, because it's, it's different than a fever. Uh, hyperthermia could be due to a medical problem or it could be due to being locked in a car, you know, and the uh, um, heat gets so high. So this is not... Nothing to do with antipyretics. Their fevers are 106. And what do you do? Well, we put them on cooling blankets underneath and on top, and we cool them down. Now, <laughs> that sounds mean, right? Putting all this ice on them and make them lay on it and on top. So we sedate them too. We'll give them something to keep them calm. And, and that's what you need to know about hyperthermia. There's always that we take the temperature. You know, when these little, you know, forehead, ear things rub around, um, ear thermometers first came out, they really weren't that accurate. This is many years ago, but today they're getting really, really good. Um, go to the dollar store and buy a dollar little electric thermometer. That's what I tell my, my parents. You don't need the six or six dollar or ten dollar one from one of your little pharmacies. Um, it works just as well. Um, click it on and put it on. And I always say do it twice if you don't believe what the number is, right? Twice will probably give you what you want. We know that with infants, we're going to do first of all that rectal temperature at birth. And then from there on, we're going to do axillary. We always do axillary. Unless, of course, if you have the, you know, the temporal or the tympanic ear um, thermometers, we'll do it with that. We don't do core temperature. And that is what we would actually use when they were hyperthermic. That because their temperature's gone up because something neurologically is going on. We put in a rectal temperature probe and we watch it and it's part of the cooling machine. And that cooling machine works with the temperature that they're getting from the uh, client. So pain. Pain is the fifth vital sign. Back in the early 2000s, the Joint Commission said that we were not um, evaluating uh, pain, especially in children. I've said that we had let kids suffer and have too much pain. And we needed to develop up programs that showed that we were looking at um, pain, that we knew about how to identify it, and then that we did something or an intervention for it, and that we went back and did an evaluation. Well, the hospital I worked at came up with something called PI. So pain is you recognized it, I is intervention, and E, you evaluate, go back, did it work? Now, these scales have been around for a while. And what they do is they measure what a kid is having pain. Now, kids three and less and nonverbal will get a flax scale. And the flax scale looks at their face. Are they grimacing? Their legs, are they moving and thrashing? Their activity, are they sitting there not moving or are they just really thrashing all over? Their um, cry, are they crying a lot or not? And then can you console them? And it is an excellent, excellent pain scale. I've used it on your young infants and toddlers and I've used it on 18 year old cerebral palsy children that were nonverbal. It works for both, okay? And then from ages three, now the preschool, 
up to age eight is the FACES scale. It's called the Wong Baker FACES scale. And I think it is so cute. These kids, I'm like, these are the pictures. This is no pain. And this is really the worst pain you could ever feel. Point to the picture you feel you are. And they're so honest. And they point to a six or an eight or whatever it is. Or they point to the 10. And you do know they are a 10. Remember, if you rate above a four, you've got to do intervention. Was it repositioning? Was it a warm pack, a hot pack? Because those distraction type things work in conjunction with pain medicine, which could be Tylenol, ibuprofen, or morphine. Um, it works in conjunction and it all works better. And in children, distract them somehow. Give them a puzzle, give them a TV program, turn on music, do something. Now, wait. I can't tell you um, more about why we weigh and do heights on children every visit. Adults don't do that. Parent, uh, the the um, adult world physicians don't really care how much you weigh. So how much do you weigh? You can lie all you want, right? But in children, they do a height and weight every visit. And why? Well, especially your infant, we know they triple their birth weight by one year, right? And we know that they have gone from not knowing how to grab a rattle to now they're shaking it and putting it in their mouth and cooing and smiling and giggling and saying mama or dad that, right? So if we see a kid who's not gaining the weight, not gaining the height because the fuel tank's not filled with nutrition, we know that they are behind and it could be due to nutrition. Now, if it's the weight is good and they're still behind, we look for other stuff too, okay? Another thing with weight, you know, the BSA, most, most body surface area, most accurate way to give medications, okay? We know that neonates and young children are almost like the flip side uh, adults that their body systems are not mature or the older ones are broken down, right? We have to be very careful and giving proper dosages. In children, it's milligrams per kilogram, micrograms per kilogram, and that's the most accurate way that we give it. So children in the hospital are kilograms. They are not weighed in pounds. You know, the height, I just, I'll draw it right on to you know, the little paper um, stretcher. You know, sometimes I'll just take even put little marks on the sheets. You know, I'm gonna get an accurate, accurate height. Then I just take the tape and I'll measure it. It's easier on the younger children, you know, than you just trying to sit there and hold the tape next to them. It does, it's not as accurate. So I'll put where they are up top, on bottom, and I'll measure it and that's gonna be a great height. Again, it's showing, is it nutrition? Remember, infants gain one inch every month for the first six months. So heights at this point are really showing you your nutritional status, isn't it? Children that are older, you know, you think it's easy just to take that little thing and put it down on their head. No, you have to show that child it's not going to hurt. Actually, I let them hold it. I say, you put it there. You tell me when you get there and we'll get to see really how tall you are now. Because um, they think it's going to come down and bop them and hurt them. And, and you think that's not true? <laughs> I've had kids run out of the triage room because they didn't want to get their heights done. Very important with infants that we do head circumference. In the newborn ICU, we do it every shift as the beginning um, assessment. And we're measuring what's going on in the head. Um, it just goes right around above the eyebrows, around the whole head. And, you know, if you don't get a good uh, number, doesn't look like the last one, I take it off and we just do it again. Yes, Christina. I, I have a question with this because I work in family medicine and sometimes we pick up pediatric patients. On this head circumference thing, I always struggle with it. Are, are we folding that piece of tape back so that we can get it right at the uh, beginning or is it inappropriate and we should keep that piece of 
paper tape. It doesn't matter around. either way. As long as you're getting the number by where the the um, tape starts. Yeah, okay. there's, always a there's always a little extra. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Um, you can see here, this one folded over so that she was really accurate. But gotcha. you, you really, really don't have to. And it's really the biggest part of the head, you know, that okay. we see it there. I mean, why are we doing this and why do we do head circumferences? Well, we have infants have fontanelles there, right? And we know there's a lot of growth and stuff going on. Um, we have a chance of always hydrocephalus, right? And we want to catch that quick because if that swelling gets on and it gets too big too quick, you're compressing the brain and you get brain damage, seizures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we definitely really need some good head circumferences. I mean, not only are we going to do head circumferences, we're looking at those fontanelles, right? We know the top one's going to be there till 12 to 18 months. Usually 15 months is that medium time. The one in the back, the posterior fontanelle, it's gone in six to eight weeks. So watching that up there, really important. Measuring with it, um, their the tape, their head circumference. And then if it's not closing or closed too quick, both of those are concerning and needs to be reported to the physician. Okay, thank you so much. No, you're very welcome. Dawn, yes, may I help you? Also in family practice, you might talk to your office manager. So instead of using just the flat paper or the tape measure, they do have some that are, they almost resemble like a belt and that feeds through a loop. So it's already rounded and all you have to do is slide it over the top of the head and then pull it tight and the line lines up right at the number. Sometimes those are a lot easier to do when you have a baby moving. Yes. So you might ask your office manager if they can reach out to somebody and get some of those in the office. A lot of times um, they can reach out to certain people like CDC and CDC will tell them or bring them to them. And it does make your job a lot easier. Okay. No, that's very good advice. Absolutely. Yes, some infants, it's really an like a, um, a toddler, a one-year-old, you're trying to do it. They're trying to wiggle all over and you're trying to hold them down and pushing out their legs and, you know, getting that extra height. In some cases is really, really important because maybe there are problems and nutritional problems and that height, we want to make sure that they are growing that the, the way that they should. So yes, that, that's very good. Thank you so much. Okay, collecting specimens. Well, the first thing I want you to know about collecting specimens, the most, most important thing is once you get it, make sure you label it. I want you to know the hardest thing is doing blood on a young child, infant, baby. And, you know, the parents are already upset that you had to stick a needle in them and draw blood. Then you don't label it and you send it to the lab and they tell you, we can't use this. It's not labeled. You have to redraw it and it will happen. It will happen. So with that in mind, first of all, you check the doctor's office. What do you need? Make sure you have the proper paperwork that goes with the blood and make sure that you've got the proper containers. And if you don't know, call the lab. What color, what color top does that go in? And the lab would rather you um, ask and the parents would so that you do not Oh, I've got to go get more blood. There's nothing worse than having to get more blood on a child. Um, the parents are not going to like you very much, and either is that child. Make sure when you're collecting the specimens, you're using proper, proper procedure. Of course, wearing gloves, cleaning the area if it's blood, um, or making sure that you don't touch stuff with a uh, culture and sensitivity, making sure, you know, the inside of containers that are also for quote, sterile or clean catch, um, making sure you do that is part of this year. Again, make sure it's labeled accurately and I'll always stick my initials on it. If it requires it to be carried, make sure that you get someone to carry it over to the lab as soon as you can. 
I, the worst thing is to have lab specimens sitting there. You told somebody to do it. They didn't. And an hour later, you're looking for results and they're still sitting on the unit. Haven't gone down to the lab yet. You know, I always found myself sometimes saying, oh, all right, I'm going to go for a walk. You know, I know in the ER, it was on the opposite end of the hospital. It was like a half mile joint. It felt like it's a really long way, but that's part of it. Again, always document what you take. Now, young infants in the newborn ICU, we document how much blood we take out whenever we do a blood draw. The interesting thing for you to know, if you don't know, little premature infants, they usually like to do a CBC and they like to do an electrolyte, especially if they're new, especially they're on hyperalimentation and haven't started to eat yet. They really have to follow those uh, electrolytes closely and they have to follow after birth a CBC to make sure there's no uh, incidence of sepsis, that their hemoglobin's right, et cetera, or even their bilirubin. You can do all of that with 1.2 mLs of blood in two little specimens. So there are tiny little things we can use. And then if you ever work in the uh, pediatric area, you're going to be shown how to take it the easiest and least traumatic for that, especially that infant. You don't want a big bruised heel because we do it from the heel of their foot most of the time. Those two specimen can. The only one that we have to take in a stick would be a blood coagulopathy. Those PT, PTTs looking for bleeding. Types of specimens, urine, blood, uh, stool, cerebral spinal fluid. One of the most things that please don't forget to label that. And I've seen, I'm expressing to you these things because I've seen them not labeled. Okay, and then I've had to go down and beg with the lab, making sure. I said, let me look at it. This is what it looked like. Let me see it. Let me see the bag. Let me see the requisition, you know, um, and, and they'll have, they're not supposed to, you know, let um, me put a label on it. Always follow protocol. You'll never be wrong if that's what you do. And urine shouldn't be out of a diaper. Um, what they do with infants is if it's just they weren't doing like, we do like uh, every shift, we look at sugar in the blood or we look at ketones. We can squeeze that out of a diaper because it's a little drop that we put on a little stick and we do it at the bedside. But a urine specimen will put a bag on that child um, or if it needs be, we'll do a catheterization if it's not a super, super tiny premature infant, okay? And then if it's one of those super little tiny ones, there, there might be other things we do, um, but we'll usually you make sure we put a bag on. Can I ask a question about sure. that bag? Sure, Um, With the urine that you have to collect, and I know this may sound funny, but... um the fibers and stuff inside the diaper or what have you would not compromise that sample at all? If you have a bag on, you are really attaching it around that area. So the diaper is not in contact with it. This bag is on the infant stuck, like with, you know, glue sort of stuff. And we stick it there and they urinate in the bag. Now, it can't be a culture because there's the skin and skin contaminants and little girls will still have like cheesy inside the labia, which could um, make it a bad specimen where there was no urinary tract infection. Do you understand, Gannett? Okay, yeah. So so before when you said like you squeeze it from the, the diaper, that wouldn't... But, but it doesn't compromise that result. Okay. It's just a stick that we do. Okay. And it's just sugar and ketones. It's just a quick look at what's going on with that child. It's like a spot check. And okay. they we do that right at the bedside. It's the nurses who do that sort of thing. Okay, a nurse is admitting a three-year-old child with a very high fever who's restless and crying. What safety measures should the nurse institute on admission of this child? Well, what concerns are we worried about 
with a toddler turning preschooler. Safety. Yep, falling out of the crib, so. We maybe put this kid in a high top? Absolutely. They will, cl they will climb. What else? Um, choking, if they play with any of the toys, make sure the toys aren't sharp or loose. Absolutely, because, you know, a lot of times parents will have them in the crib. They're sitting there and they have their toys in the crib and it's in the mouth and now they're choking. Yes, um, very good one. You know, keeping it away from the back wall with all the equipment, right? <laughs> and they have a fever. I mean, you know, some of the safety is, you know, get that fever down, get that kid feeling better. You know, mm -hmm. and then, of course, uh, we can do proper care and they can uh, have fluids, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this is always, always that we're concerned about is safety with children and making sure that we've covered bases because kids get into everything. They're just curious. It's just who they are. So we know, and I, I've already just started to mention that. There are a lot of um, things that we have to watch out for, especially with young kids. And this happens also in the elderly. There's differences in absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of medications. How quickly does it go in? How quickly does it get where it needs to go? And does the liver work the way it should? And does the kidneys work the way they should? That um, metabolism and that um, excretion, right? So again, we have to be careful with dosage of medications. I would always, as I started in the pediatrics, I would always look up drugs. You know, today you guys are so lucky. There are computers all over. You have these little, especially you work in a hospital, you have your own personal computer and there's a little tab that has this little desk reference for medications and you click on it and you could find out everything you need to know. And always the pharmacist is there to aid with you, making sure that you're giving proper doses. I always say, when in doubt, ask. Because if you're not sure, you can hurt a kid. And that's the last thing. I would feel horrible if I hurt a kid, right? So the other thing is know what the medication does and go back and check the child, whether good, good outcomes or adverse reactions. You know, for instance, those antibiotics, making sure is the kid have a rash now? Let me pull up those jammies. Let me look inside. Do I see a rash, something going on, right? So absorption of medications in infants and children. We know that my husband's mother. So one of the things about absorptions is remember their bodies are all immature, right? So when we put it in there, you know, their stomach, do we need to give it with food, without food? Because remember that works with absorptions. Um, their GI, if they're having diarrhea, that medication's going out quick. In elderly, remember, constipated, those medications stay in and it's completely absorbed. So higher levels will be there. Remember those things as we're doing this with children. And then topical medications. I always say more is not better, less is best because it absorbs. Uh, I'm gonna tell you an example of what I mean. I had an eight year old boy come into the ER. He had had strep, I think, and was on antibiotics and he broke out with a rash head to toe and he was itchy. And he came in with his father. His father said, I gave him a dose of Benadryl, and then I rubbed him from head to toe with Benadryl lotion. This kid came in in catatonic state. It's like a double dose, right? Oh, it was a quadruple dose. It was like super duper a lot. Now, it wore off. It was okay, but it really put into why we only put a little on. Can you imagine putting a lot of steroid cream everywhere? All of a sudden, now you're going to be messing with your adrenal glands and steroids, and you don't want to do those things. So telling parents, 
Littler is better. You know, just cover the area you need. Don't go crazy and only do it as directed. Very important. Um, you'll remember that with, with that story. Remember IV medications? Once you put it in, it's gone. So always make sure that the IV is good, it's patent, you know, and that it's not red, it's not swollen, and always IV medications, make sure you check your dose as well. Because once you push it in, there's no coming back. So the metabolism of children, this is your liver. Just like adults, again, the liver is slow. And we know that you're metabolizing them. And again, now you're worried about drug levels. Now, where did you hear about drug levels and being concerned about peaks and troughs and making sure that we don't make them toxic? That's your amino glucosides. This is your big, heavy gun antibiotics like vancomycin is one of those ones. Making sure that those levels are where you want. And usually when they start them, they do them after the third dose, before the fourth dose, whatever the physician decides on. And sometimes I've given medications every two days because that's the way it was metabolized and excreted in this body. So really thinking about that and understanding that, that you sometimes meds stay there and they build up and now they're toxic. Same thing to do with excretion, same thing. We know that their kidneys, yeah, they're working, sure, but they still are, you know, sometimes slow um, and they're immature. So if you had your stomach, your, your intestines isn't moving good, maybe you're that constipated kid, right? Or too fast, it's running out. And then you have a liver that's immature, you can have high levels, low levels, so... These are things that we need to think about, all right? And I know physicians do. Our goal is not to have a kid toxic on any sort of medication. So our responsibility with kids giving medications, you know, you might see a rash from head to toe like that. That's really easy to see. Uh, sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's maybe a little diaper rash. Maybe it's a little bit of stomach cramping, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, um, could be just slightly spit up, things that aren't, you normally see, um, what you ask the parents, do you see anything that's not, you know, that the child's doing that's not normal, um, let me know, you know, and, and I'll come and evaluate it. So always when you give a medication, always when you do a treatment or procedure, you always chart their response, good or bad. Did it work? Did they handle the procedure or medications? No allergic reaction seen. Okay, very important. There are every medications do have what we call safety ranges. Um, that's why we do safe dosaging, right? It's something we learned, you know, in um, dosage calculation, making sure uh, when we're giving something. I mean, if I see something that looks like a big dose, I'm like, so. How many milligrams per kilogram per day per dose am I supposed to give? Making sure I'm not overdosing the kids. So parent teaching, as I said, I do this all the time. If I'm taking care of a kid, touching a child, I'm talking to the kid and cooing and gooing and gagas and, you know, playing peekaboo and talking. But I'm not only talking to the child, I'm talking for the parent to be listening. And they're hearing what I'm doing how I'm doing it, and how I'm getting it done by the manner I'm getting it done. How to give medications. I, I can't tell you how many parents say, my kids won't take these medications. So I had to teach them tricks, you know, how to do it. Older kids, um, you know, when you get into that preschool area, I'm going to ask them, do you want a pill? Do you want a liquid? Do you want it in a cup, syringe? You know, I'm going to give them certain things and uh, they're not going to be able to veer from that. If they want to chew a pill, okay. And then I'll say, you know, you get that done. I'm going to give you a Powerade or a, a Popsicle if they can afterwards. So there is, they'll take it. And then they're worried about the taste in their mouth here. There's something to drink when you're done, right? 
always, always, always check your dosages. Don't assume that it's been given for three days that those dosages are correct. I've seen three days later, they're not. So always do that. Again, there are all these tricks for these kids. I'm making them getting it. So um, you would say, well, put it in the milk, put it in the bottle. Don't ever put medications in a bottle. What if they don't finish the bottle? Did they take their medications? Because if they're an antibiotic, they're not getting their dose. If it's a tiny little bit of food, you can put it in with a spoon to give it to them. But I wouldn't put it in a big piece of food, okay? So that's the thing with medicines and children. It is really um, sometimes a challenge, but you have to, again, make it a game because I like to play. If at all possible, we want to give everything oral. We don't want to have to do um, anything, you know, invasive if we possibly can. All right. Parenteral is considered nose drops, ear drops, and eye drops also, and rectally. And parental also, I call it anything with a needle, sub Q, I, M, I, V. Um, these are all manners. Uh, children who are in pain always think they're getting a shot. And sometimes they have an IV in already. So you need to tell them, I'll get you something for pain, but you're not going to have no needle. I'm going to put the medicine in that tube right there. And then, they'll go, oh, okay, then they'll take it. And now they're not going to be as afraid. There's all types of IVs out there for all different reasons. Um, that up there is a Broviac. Uh, most of all today, I've seen more of the plants, uh, of the ports put in. Um, ports are underneath the skin and it goes into the heart. And there's nothing like that top up there, that Broviac, where it's sticking out. Some children pull on it and pull it out. You know, or sometimes they're rolling around playing and it catches and it pulls out. So it, to go home, and some children need to go home with these things if they are cancer patients um, or have some sort of condition that requires frequent IV administration and stuff they're going to be getting something called a port. They do it in adults. They do it in children. So it would be on the right or left side. Rarely, though, I've seen it in the middle, that underneath there's this little metal thing, and on top there's like a nipple. You can feel it with your fingers under the skin. And what we do is we put numbing cream on it. And we even teach the parents, if they're coming to the ER, to say the kid has a fever. And any kid with a fever undergoing chemotherapy with cancer, they need to come in. They need to have their blood drawn. They need IV antibiotics. That's just part of the protocol. The parents put numbing cream on it, put a Band-Aid on it, and they come to the ER. By the time they get to us, we can gown up in our sterile attire, and we can insert the port. There's a little needle we stick in there. And it's, we tape it up really well, put a nice stick -em on it for their time in the hospital. And then when they're done to go home, we take it out. And then there's nothing sitting there on the chest. And it actually helps with um, infection, okay? We know that there's pick lines. Again, they still stick out. They're tiny little catheters. It's peripherally inserted central catheter. I've actually had several of them, <clears throat> four or five times I've had to have them because of really bad sinus infections and nothing was clearing me. So they put it in under some sort of ultrasound into the uh, arm and then it goes up and it goes into the heart. And then they check it, make sure it's in the heart and then they do, um, they, they'll, they'll flush it. And these uh, we need to keep open and patent. And usually we insert a little bit of heparin flush in there. Peripheral IVs today only need normal saline flush. You know, years ago, we would put a little heparin in there. But can you imagine six times a day you're flushing that peripheral IV? You're giving a little heparin every time. That's why we don't do that anymore. That's why it's only just normal saline. And it works. They don't clot off. So giving kids shots, how much do we give? Now, again, it depends on the age of the child, how big the child is. <clears throat> they say infants and IM should not be anything more than 0.5 mLs. 
And we know that's vastus lateris. That's their upper outer thigh, right? Toddlers, usually the younger kids, those also will be in the vastus lateris. Or sometimes they go ventral gluteal. But um, mostly um, into their vastus lateris. They can go to one ml. Their body can hold it. You can't put two mLs in these small areas. It's just too much volume creating too much irritation of that medication in that muscle there. Adolescents, we can do them in their arms, but they're um, one mL also. But if we need to give more, we either can put it vastus lateris, ventral gluteal. And if it's something like solumedrol, a steroid, there are, or rocephin, uh, an antibiotic, that has to be put not in an arm. It burns and it's painful. And um, it needs to be somewhere with more big muscles. And, you know, that's by the buttocks. That's a better, better area for that. So just know there's different amount of fluid that can be given. And um, never, even with an adolescent, more than three mLs at all on your bigger adolescents. So like I said, IV medications goes directly in, it's absorbed quickly, and you need to really look at those IV sites. I have seen where tops of hands, tops of feet are necrotic and fall off due to medications given in IVs like that. Yes, Morgan. So, Professor, so we wouldn't do a Z-track on a child at all, even if they school age? Um, why do we give Z-tracks? Like, if it's like a burning medicine, kind of like, um, not potassium, but like certain iron that you uh, should. No, iron, you absolutely, anything burns or discolors, yeah, pull it up, give it, and, and lock it. I call it the lock and the load type of uh, medication to hold it in there. Um, you know, I actually do a lot of those with normal medications, but mm -hmm. when it gets in the muscle, it burns. So it's not the outside. If it's in the arm, um, solumedrol in an adolescent, it's mm -hmm. going to burn. It has to go into the buttocks or like bicillin, that white, thick antibiotic. You're not putting that in an arm. I had it one time in my butt. And I felt like a big lump. And when I ran for months afterwards, it still helped. It really hurt. So yeah. those I gave, are what I'm talking about. I gave Rosefin, um when I worked in Pete's in the in the buttocks because it stings. And sometimes, um, like I know one patient had a really bad infection. She had to get two doses. So she came one day. And then I think it was like 48 hours later, she had to get the second one. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. In fact, in the hospitals in the ER where I work, they would mix this rocephin, ceftriaxone, which is a broad spectrum used for everything antibiotic. Um, we mix it with some lidocaine because it's that, that painful. And mm -hmm. it's just routine um, where I used to work. So when we are giving any fluids to children, they're immediately on intake and output. So we need to really monitor and document what we're doing. Document the IV site every hour. Is it red? Is it swollen? Is it leaking? Is it painful? All of those things really important to look at. Um, you know, today we don't really worry about volume just dumping in big from IV bags. You guys have IV pumps for everything. You know, uh, when I started nursing, we didn't have IV pumps. We didn't even have that flow rate, that dial a flow thing. We didn't even have that. We had that blue little clamp that went up and down. So the chances of it just falling in big amounts was huge. So, but today, um, yes, you pay attention. If you're using that little thing that fills up called a burette, you know, fill it up every two hours. Um, with that much fluid, I mean, that is the protocol usually in most places. But, you know, with these IV pumps, we're a lot better today for risk of uh, volume overload. We, we don't really have that as much anymore. So a kid getting IV fluid and, you know, needs to get an IV in. 
you know, today we have people in the pediatric environment called child life. Child life are extremely well-educated people up to a doctoral level, minimum of a bachelor level that will come in, talk to your child, bring them the equipment, bring a doll, you know, having distracted and will speak to them in their developmental level. They are taught all about growth and development and children and the way that they think. And they are such a great assistance to nursing. Um, and they'll get them prepared. And then we come in as nurses. Of course, we do our little things too. But the kid already knows what's going to happen. They know what things are and what they're going to feel or not feel. And um, it becomes an easier type of um, treatment because they, they're aware. Even your younger kids want to know. Or we can get them looking at video games and on an iPad or playing a game or, you know, a little video of, you know, whatever characters they like. I mean, there's so many things we can do for that distraction in order to get an IV in and to do it safely. And then once we get these IVs in, making sure that they're secure. And secure doesn't mean taped up that you can't see the site. It means secure that maybe we put an arm board on and that we have it taped there. And the tubing is taped so that it can't just pull out. Uh, they've got things what we like they call a house. It's a plastic thing that'll go up top that you pull it over and look at the site and put it back on. And this helps you um, keep these IVs um, in, number one, and keep it safe for the child. I mean, there's always going to be six rights of medications, right? It doesn't matter who you're giving a medication to, but absolutely, you know, children, what right patient, drug, dose, time, route, and then always make sure as soon as you give a medication, you document it. Calculating pediatric doses, as I said, body surface area is actually the most accurate of all of the type of calculating doses. In the hospital, we're going to do milligrams, micrograms per kilogram, um, like ceftriaxone or cefin is 50 to 100 milligrams per kilogram per dose. It's, I just know what it is, depending on severity of, of the infection that this kid is in. So always knowing these things, remembering, writing it down, have that little book in your pocket, looking up on the computer really saves errors. So pediatric ERs, uh, IVs, um, you know, that usually then if they're getting an IV, many of them get to be admitted. So these kids are going to have to live with their IV. The kid sucks the right hand thumb. Are you going to put an IV in that right hand? Absolutely not. So you'll put it in the other hand, right? Because you need to think about that. Are you going to put it in the bend of the arm so the arm has to be like pushed out? Oh, absolutely not. Very important to think of these things. And some nurses don't, honestly. And then you've got this IV in a weird place and the family's complaining and, well, I need to stick your kid again. They're like, oh, no, forget it. We're not going to do that because they don't want their kid to go through this again. So having the family there, finding out, does the kid favor an arm or a leg or whatever? Because you can put them in the feet. You can put them in their hands. There's so many places where we can put IVs in these children. So um, knowing where is the best position. I mean, if we're going to do it in a foot and the kid is mobile walking, that's not a good thing either. So again, there's so much consideration. This little picture of this little hand, that little plastic thing, that's the house I was talking about. And that helps protect it. The upper picture has a kid who's very active and likes to pull and touch stuff. Well, that'd be where you put the elbow protectors on so they can't get to the IV or whatever equipment that you don't want to be touched, okay? Preventing drug interactions. You know, again, um, when I was in the ER giving medications and I'd pull up a drug, some of them will say, 
is the kid on this or is the kid taking that and or is the IV infusing with this um, and they'll tell you you can't take it because you have to answer, you know, no, no, no. One of the one things is, you know, rocephin can't be given with Ringer's lactate in an IV fluid. And they'll ask you a question. Is the child on IV fluids with Ringer's lactate? And you have to say no until you can pull out that medic that medication and give it. Um, remember, there are some crazy things. Usually, if it's child's in a hospital, the pharmacist will look at the drugs and the interactions and they'll let you know. But there are sometimes things get ordered and it goes through the cracks and it's something that, you know, we're not going to know all of everything all at once. I would always ask a senior nurse or I would, you know, I worked night shift forever. I'd call the pharmacist in the middle of the night. You know, they're, yes, they're, they're awake. It's they're in the pharmacy, but you know, Hey, uh, I have to give this medicine. Um, the kids on this, is it okay? And then you learn and you remember again, ask before you do it. Dilantin, this phenoyton, that's a, what we call a anti-seizure drug. And an anti-seizure drug can't be given with an antacid because it will just knock it out and not make it work because it has to start digestion in the stomach. Iron should be given with citric acid, right? But you can't give it with an egg. So we would make sure that we would give it two hours after breakfast, right? Or an hour before. These are things that we need to think about. There's not a lot of them, but there's enough. There are drugs we have to roll up in uh, tinfoil, foil paper, because it can't hit the sunlight. So there's all these different things. It's something that if you don't know, again, go and look it up. That saving that doing two minutes of looking up can save a lot of time and energy. Now, many of uh, children, you'll see adults too that need a tube feed and they need it for whatever reason. Maybe they're too small, they can't suck, swallow, and breathe, or maybe they have some sort of condition where they don't want them, you know, using their mouths. So we just put a tube down into their stomach and we're going to feed them. Now, there's two types of gavage feeding. There's one we call a gastrostomy tube or a nasal gastrostomy tube where they put it in the nose and it goes into the stomach. And then we check to see if there's anything left there before we start the new feed. We make sure that it's on the number on the tube that's taped there because that's documented. Is it still on number 16? Okay, it is. All right, it hasn't moved. Okay, there was a little bit of stomach juice in when I pulled out uh, before I fed them and then I'm gonna feed them. Remember when we're feeding them, a lot of times nurses want to get it over with. So they pull it up and want to push it in. Well, how would you feel if all of a sudden you got eight ounces of, uh, you know, food in your stomach and in one second, your tummy would hurt. So let it drip in slowly that the way that it can, right? And another thing, I give them a pacifier. Now they feel that feeling of sucking, that pleasure, and now their tummies are getting bigger, right? Gastrostomy tubes have to be given sometimes where a child's not able to eat. Um, it could be many, 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 many different reasons. Maybe they just don't know swallowing. Maybe they aspirate. Maybe they have tracheal malaysia. I mean, they're, they're, I could go on and on and on. And sometimes they're permanent and sometimes they're forever. There are different types. There's one that the thing in the tube hangs out and that's the bottom one. And then there's the one up top that we call a button or a mick. And that little thing that says lock screws and comes off when you're done with the feeding. So you're just left with a little button on, that comes out of the abdomen. And it's easier for the kid to get up and move around. It is done in surgery. And um, there are those two different types. Now, why wouldn't they all just get the one that locks and clicks, right? You say, isn't that easier and the other one won't pull? Well, I'll tell you very honestly, it's usually insurance. 
What does the insurance approve for that child to be able to have? Usually the younger kids will get the one that hangs out, the you know newborn infants. And then as they get older and move, they put in the other one where we could take that extension tubing off. The other tube that they have that I was gonna mention was not only the nasal gastric tube, sometimes they put it further past the stomach into the duodenum. So it prevents reflux, it prevents vomiting. And that's why they do it there. They do duodenum or jejunostomy. They, they do it past the stomach. Those are those sort of tubes. And then these are your two types of G tubes. Now, when Christian was three years old, we were potty training. He had just had the flu. And all of a sudden I noticed he wasn't urinating for 24 hours. So he had a little stool that one day before but anyway, we ended up taking him to the emergency room and his stomach looked like that picture right down there. His stomach was full of stool. It blocked the urethra. He was unable to urinate and he had all this stool. And after the x-ray, they gave him a Fleet's enema. Fleet's enemas are usually given for that situation like that was he, not normal. He was constipated, full of stool, wasn't urinating. He needed the stool to come out quick. So we put on a diaper two sizes bigger than he normally took. I held him and just, you know, took his tummy and rubbed it when he was done. And he filled up the diaper and he felt better and he urinated. And that was the end of it. We don't like to use these consistently. Children that are constipated, there's many other things that we could do. Okay. Fleets are good to do. We don't do enemas like with just tap water. You know, uh, we've learned about hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic solutions. We put this hypotonic or just water into the bowel. It's going to suck all of the electrolytes and all of, you know, the hypertonic type of area, pull it in there. And then you'll be losing and being electrolyte imbalance, and it really could cause a lot of issues that way. So enemas, we give them, turn them on their side, even infants, put their leg up, put it in, hold, pinch the butts for a second, put them in their diaper, and then I just give them back to mommy, and they eventually will go. Always document what did you give, how do you give, and the response. So respirations. Um, respirations, you know, these kids, uh, as I said, breathe really crazy and slow and fast. Um, we know that kids, um, we'll, we'll see them restless. Usually there, something's going on. If you see their heart rate going up, they're getting dizzy. They're getting confused. Something's happening, um, to these children. You're going to see difficulty in breathing. You might hear noise, inspiratory, expiratory, retractions, intercostal, right in between your clavicle bones, right here in children, you'll see it start pulling back. I call them retracting to the backbones, um, something that's very, very dangerous in children. So um, documenting what you see. Infants who are grunting and nasal flaring are your children. You need to do something quick too. Um, these kids are in severe respiratory re distress. And that grunt is at the end of a breath. They go, eh, eh, eh. and you'll see them rocking and their nose will be flaring in and out. So if you hear these sort of things, something needs to be going on. You know, they need to be repositioned, maybe suction, maybe they need to have oxygen and know that there's all different things that can occur. Um, initially, and we're going to go into it further down in the course. I mean, when they're born and they're coughing and sputtering and choking, it could mean that the connection isn't where it should be in the throat and to the uh, trachea. And it's something that, what do you do? Well, we're not going to feed these kids and try to get that suction out of there. I mean, it could be that it's too narrow or it's just floppy um, or there's an infection, something going on there. You know, managing the airway, if the kid gets something in their throat, remember, we, you know, we'll do those abdominal thrusts and chest pats. 
uh, remember to look um, at these things or the bigger kids, you know, it's like the Heimlich thing. Preoperative, postoperative, you know, children are, uh, need to be known what's going to happen to them. They need to be prepared. Um, and they do a lot of pre-op teaching now. You have all of these uh, surgical nurse practitioners, and we have these child life that work with the surgical team, which teach the child what's going to happen. What's so awesome today is years ago, parents were not even allowed into the holding area in the OR. They were not allowed in the recovery room in the OR until after they went to the floor. Today, they bring their kid to the OR, they put them to sleep, and then they leave. So these kids are not afraid. We know every kid, you know, having surgery needs to be maintained NPO. It's not like adults. It's not after midnight. Um, younger kids, it could be two hours NPO. Older kids, toddlers could be four to six hours. And always, you know, self-soothing. Younger kids, give them a pacifier. And it really does help, okay? And then postoperatively, especially if the kid had something that hurts, make sure that we're medicating them, giving them what do they need to help themselves, right? Um, and, you know, explain to them. You'd be surprised, and I have learned that a newborn can put the mother around a finger. You know, they're so smart. Toddlers understand, you know, and it's literally teaching them, showing them, distracting them. Um, they're not going to be as afraid because it, it's that fear of not known is when they really are upset. So an infant still wears a diaper, was admitted to pediatric unit with diarrhea. The last uh, lasted several days. The physician has ordered the application of hydrocortisone cream to the infant's reddened buttocks. Should the nurse be concerned about this ordered? It's a reddened open area that we're putting steroids on. What do you think? Yes, it needs to be considered. Absolutely, Yudi. I mean, can you imagine? It's going directly into the bloodstream. So there are other choices. Hydrocortisone wouldn't be it. So did you see how we thought that and said, no, just because he ordered it, no, um, that, that could be a problem. So enough stuff for you today. We'll do one of the cahoots and the other one I'm going to send to you uh, to go over with, okay? How's that sound? And then we'll be done with today. Who wants to win today? I'll give a shot. <laughs> I, there you I go, might give Rose. someone I might give someone else a shot today. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're so sweet. <laughs> I love it. All right. And there we go. Is that one? You know, I was watching Wheel of Fortune and this one guy was winning everything. And I was like, why didn't he let somebody else win some money? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he, you could see he knew the answer and he let somebody else win. I'm like, that's the way it should be. I mean, come on. You already have $30,000 for somebody else win, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not that rich, but I have, I let somebody else win. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, give them a run for the money. All right, let's get going. I know you're still coming in, but I want to get this one done and get you out on time. Can I get the, the, the barcode? What was the pin again? Hold on a second. So after instilling nose drops, the nurse will keep the infant in the head down position for how long? The code is three, four, three, four, four. <clears throat> you know, and remember, before nose drops, you should make sure the area is clear before you put it in or it's not going to work. And they say 30 seconds to a minute. 
you should leave it there so it goes and does what it's supposed to do. When planning care for a toddler, what behaviors do we need to consider to promote security? This is a question, really, you know, from the beginning of, of this um, okay. quarter. Okay. Toddlers are all about what? Me, 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 mine, 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 I do. All right? But they're also into, they like rituals or they like a schedule. They like to do the same thing all the time. Rituals is another word for doing the same thing all the time. They uh, feel safe because they know what's coming. Toddlers. According to Maslow, what level of hierarchy of needs correlate with measuring vital signs and their oxygen saturations? You know, Maslow it starts at the bottom, physiologic needs, and it goes up to esteem. Uh, when you read, uh, go through the uh, exam review, I describe it a little more, and we actually look at it. And it's actually physiologic. That's just basic. That's the basic things you need. And then it goes up to what do I do well? And let's, you know, emphasize that. So that's the esteem part, the top of the pyramid. A child explains that the nurse that he got sick because he went swimming in the rain. According to Biaget, which is it? Who is that person who's sick? Who got swimming in the rain? How old do you think he is? And which one should it be here? I mean, in Miami, it's because you went outside with wet hair or went to bed with wet hair. Um, this is school age. Absolutely. Remember, they got sick because of something. They got sick because they were bad. They got sick because they were swimming in the rain. They went to bed with wet hair. They went outside with wet hair. That is concrete. They know it, they see it, they understand it, and they feeling that's why there. So that's that answer. Gentamicin eardrops are prescribed for a four-year-old child. How would the nurse position the oracle? Remember there's up and back and down and out, and which one is it? Let's go back to pharmacology and remember, right? It's up and back, all right? Things like these, these little things, you'll see them again, whether here or you're on your HESI. These are those concepts they love to pull. What is the best pulse location for the nurse to use when assessing the pulse on a 12-month-old infant? How are you going to measure a heart rate? And remember I said, you're going to be measuring a heart rate on a child up to the age of five, and you're always going to do it for one minute apically. That is the best place to get the most accurate. One full minute apically. A four-year-old child asks tearfully if the IM injection will hurt. What is the nurse's most effective response? Because a four-year-old is understanding. And it looks tearfully like they're afraid, but probably they really hurt, so they need something. <laughs> then I say, are you going to lie to this kid? Never. Yes, it will. It will sting a little bit, and it'll be all better. And how about I'll give it a big, I'll rub it and give it a big hug when I'm done, all right? Or I'll put two Band-Aids on it. Band-Aids cure everything, right? Preschooler, Band-Aids, the age of Band-Aids. What antibiotic is known to cause discoloration of teeth in young children? This was actually in the 50s when it was one of the only antibiotics out there. I actually worked my first job as a nurse and um, one of the LPNs who worked with me had these gray teeth. And it was the tetracycline. And you can't get the color back once you're on the antibiotic. So would we let a doctor order tetracycline on a child 
under the age of eight? Absolutely not. In fact, I'd say choose something else. A parent tells the nurse, I'm not sure how to give this medication to my infant. How would the nurse teach the parent? The best way is you take a syringe and just slowly on the sides of the mouth, if you squirt it in the back like a big squirt, it's going to gag them and they're going to vomit it everywhere. Slowly on the side of the mouth, very easily they can get it. There are some parents who like this nipple, but they don't always get it all. We know in the syringe they're getting their medicine that they need. When should a child begin to be able to feed themselves with a spoon or a fork? This is a little bit of a review for you for your exam. I like to throw in questions from other weeks. So what they say by the end of the second year they should be able to feed themselves with a spoon or fork. Now, can they do it earlier? Oh, absolutely. It might be upside down, backwards. It doesn't matter, they're attempting. But to really feed themselves by the end of the second year. Should parents be concerned about how much fat they include in their young child's diet? As in, do you need fat? Young kids, do they need fat? Well, we start to give whole milk, right? Full fat milk to infants at one year old. And we do whole fat because they need it. It's for their central nervous system, their growth, their development. So up to the age of two, they absolutely need it. After that, we might be able to decrease it, um, but only if they were overweight a lot or something, but fat should be included in a child's diet, absolutely. What type of play are toddlers known to do? We look at toddlers, what type do they like? Preschoolers, what do they like? And school age. Remember, play is always an integral part of kids. They're always playing something. And toddlers don't share. They want to play next to another kid, but they don't share. So they're playing alone next to each other, parallel to each other, not sharing. Very good. Preschoolers, they play all together, right? Associative play, but there's really no goal. And then when we get to school age, now there's a goal. Somebody's going to win the game, like a checkers, or there's a they're building a house and blocks. And when the house is finished, there is a goal that they accomplish to do. Which restraint is most appropriate for the insertion of an IV line in a scalp vein in an infant? Yes, we can put IVs in small infants' heads. There's some great IVs up there. So the nurse is up there holding the head, putting the IV in. How are we going to keep that infant safe? And we call it a mummy restraint. And it could be just wrapping them with their blanket, right? Putting their hands up in the blanket and holding them down. That's all they need. How often should a child who has a continuous IV infusion be assessed? You have an IV in a kid. How often are you going to look at it? You know, 10, 20 mLs in a little 5 kilo kid could be a lot, and it could create big swelling. It could cause death of tissue. Every hour, you need to be looking at these IVs, prevent infiltrations. What type of method is most accurate 
way of determining the dose of medication for children. And it's called the BSA, the body surface area. And we know we give milligrams per kilograms, micrograms per kilo unit, milk, micro unit, whatever the, the, it is per kilogram. According to Kohlberg conventional morality, school age children, what do they say about this? Goldberg morality, right and wrong consequence for each. School age children want to do the right thing. They like to follow the rules. Not that they're getting a reward. They just want to do the right thing. They don't want to do something bad. That's school age. What developmental level of Freud are school age children developing to form friendships? You know, Freud's all about same-sex peers, and he calls that latency. Latency, why is that word? I don't know. But orality is infants. Anal, anal is that toddler potty training. And phallic is the preschooler. Girls liking dads and boys liking moms and, and all that exploration that's going on. So that's how I ruled the other ones out. It's latency. Adolescents are all about body image. Erickson describes this how. You have like six questions on theorists on this coming up exam. That's why I hit you with some of the stuff in this cahoots, okay? And some of the concepts that are in this um, cahoots, you're going to see again on the quiz, on the exam in some manner. And that's why I did this uh, cahoot for you. It is identity versus role diffusion, which means who am I, what do I want to be, and where am I going, and who am I fitting in with, what role am I taking in life? So, and it's all about body image. And last question, what is the final stage of Piaget's developmental theory where the adolescence increases moral reasoning? Piaget, cognitive Adolescent. This is what I said earlier to y'all. And it's formal operations. Concrete operation is school age. There's a concrete building, house. They've seen it, touched it, know it. They can't do something they haven't seen before. Adolescents can fight their way out of a paper bag and think about how am I going to get what I want when I want it, where mom don't want me to do it. So what do I have to do to get that? They can think without ever having to have done that before. Concrete, I know. Formal, I am creating, okay? Here we go. Kara, number three, number two. A TIG. <laughs> Number one, Yvette, you did it again. Number four, Rowan and Kel. All right, guys, good. Uh, remember, anybody uh, who needs me to do some more uh, dosage calc or anything you want, let me know. I'll meet with you. Um, I'll be sending you the two cahoots. The other one you can go over it also. I think it's a good one on growth and development. I think this cahoot hit a lot of information um, that you need to know. So please review it before the exam. Okay. And anything I can do for anybody else. No, thank you very much. Thank you guys. Have a good weekend. I'll thank you. Too. Take care.
Thank you. You're welcome. Did you want me to stay on? Um, for the um, yeah, I'm going to sign out and come right back in, okay? Okay, thank you.